Yes, welcome to Mobile Rolling for yet another big show. Big, big show coming up, Jimmy. We've got to meet a couple of the uh, staff of HRSA. We've got Vet Talk with Toby and Liz again, Scott Barclay from uh, HRS, uh, HRSA Board. And, mate, we have got a special guest coming in the studio today, really? which you'll be very, very excited about. Yes. But first of all, let's get started with uh, Behind the Scenes at HRSA. So we've come into HRSA admin building today. We all know how great the product is that once we get out on the track and how much work the trainers, owners, drivers put in to make the product what it is. But also behind the scenes there's a fair bit goes on. So the first as we walk in to HRSA is uh, Carolyn who sits at the front desk. She's almost the gatekeeper if you like. Uh, does everything from reception, stallion registrations, syndicate registrations, same as she does all that, race day duties. So a fair bit happens here. It's not just a case of nominate the horse and let's get the product going. There's a lot of paperwork that goes on to get the uh, meetings up and running and it starts here with Caroline. She's not here at the minute, but we'll pop her in the corner and we might even find a steward around there to have a chat to. And we have found Aaron, one of our stewards at Globe Derby, um, on a uh, full-time basis. I'm tipping if he's the best bloke in the world, there's still from time to time people involved in harness racing, you don't think he's a great bloke, but uh, <laughs> we'll have a quick chat to Aaron and see what goes on from day to day, mate, in your job, full time, two meetings a week, how's your days filled here? Yeah, so in the office I um, uh, initially, we come in on a uh, Tuesday, if we start on Tuesday, we um, tidy up for race meetings, so booking swabs, sending swabs away to um, us at, over, in, over in Victoria. Yeah. Um, and then once all that's all sorted, we tend to tidy up from the race meeting it's on the weekend. So if I was chairing on the on the um, on the weekend, I'll do stewards reports. So I'll, um, I'll review races. I'll go through everything from there, make sure everything the comments yep. we got on there are all, all tidy. But yep. um, yeah, from early on, it's just tidying up from. from so the what's the standard night on a Saturday night? How many incidents would there be normally that you need to call a driver or a trainer on on the night? Oh. Uh, it varies. Obviously, you have your busy nights, you have your quiet nights. Um, um, on stand, you'd probably get half a dozen or so okay. in a night. Um, not often you'd get someone in to suspend, suspend a driver. Um, yeah. You'd only maybe get, you'd get one a weekend, but nothing yeah. over the top. Yeah. Okay. Then you've got your swabs, of course, and they don't get paid out for yes. their percentages and all their prize money until the swabs come back with hopefully a negative. So do you get the phone calls along the way, how much longer and you yeah, know, can you usually, speed it up a bit? Normally you get, you get one a week of, of someone asking where's my swab, it's been two weeks or something. Yeah. Um, normally it takes up, up to six weeks for us to get the results back Yeah. Um, and so 99 times out of 100 they're all come back negative anyway. But Yeah, um, yeah it, it's a pretty straightforward procedure. We've got to, once they're sent off, they're out of our control, it's um, waiting on, we call them Razowitz Racing Analytical. Yeah. Um, it's up to them, basically, once they've cleared their testing. As, yeah. as soon as we get the swabs back, we clear them as, as soon as we can. Yeah. And as a steward, I mean, a lot of people will think that um, you kind of sit there hoping that something will come back positive, mm. but it's the other way, isn't it? You it, just yeah. really want the sport here in South Australia to be as clean as we can possibly be, and when you get the negatives through, it's a, it's a relief for you? It is. It, it certainly is. We, um, we don't want positive. Obviously, we want as clean a racing as possible. Yeah. So, and like I said, we we would do eight, nine, ten swabs a meeting, and and ninety nine percent of the time they'll come back negative, which is it's good for us. It's um, it's good for the participants too to see all yeah. those swabs come back negative. People are getting swabbed, nothing's nothing's um, coming back. So it, it, yeah. it's it's good for the sport. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, mate. Thanks for your time. We'll no move problem. on to someone else in the building that uh, we need to have a chat to. No worries. Good to meet you. You too. Thanks. So I found the racing ops manager of uh, HRSA, David Tuan. Uh, good to meet you, mate. Um, always been interested to see what goes on out here. So if you can explain your role on a day-to-day -day basis of what you have to go through to get the meetings up and about. Yeah, so basically uh, 
we do a 12-month uh, plan on the race dates. Yep. Um, so we work that out probably around February, March of each yep. year. We do the race, planning of the race dates of where the um, meetings are held, uh, what venues and what times. Uh, and then uh, in a monthly block, then we sit down and do the programs probably in about three months advance of yep. um, when they're Put out. And there's a lot of negotiation with Sky as well involved, mate? Or? Yeah, the actual timing of the races is um, fairly restricted by Sky, including when we start and finish and yep. what days we can race. Yep. Um, that's been more and more restrictions in, over recent years, which has um, become increasingly difficult to um, yeah. negotiate. Yeah, especially going over to Sky too, I guess, a couple of times as well doesn't help us with our turnover, etc. Yeah. Um, what else is involved here for you with the fields and uh, what goes on on a two meetings a week? Yeah, so at the uh, on a Tuesday, all the nominations come into us via either on a harness web or yep. by nominations or over the phone. Yeah. And we process all the nominations, check the eligibilities of every horse yep. in every race. Uh, then um, at acceptance time, uh, often we have horses nominated in two or three races yeah. on one meeting, yeah, we so. go through their preferences and then uh, once we've determined that then we can uh, sit down and look at what races we can and can't yeah. run. And Is then, there a reason I, I see on Harness Web you might have 15 or 16 races for the meeting which means they do nominate for two, three meetings at a t uh, races in the one meeting, how, how does that come about and why do we do it like that? Uh, we normally program around t 10, 10, or 10 races as the Yep. general for each uh, race meeting and um, if, if every race uh, got up all well and good we would run yeah. all of them. Um, once again on sky restrictions if we, <laughs> if we have enough uh, time slots. Um, but uh, as a general rule uh, it's probably about eight out of the ten normally get up and yep. uh, then we just go from there. Go from there. And how are they drawn like you know sometimes you can see your horse is just lucky enough to draw barrier one and two for six starts in a row, how do, how do you draw the fields? Uh, well there are different types, there are some drawers which are random barrier drawers yep. and there are others that are preferential barrier draw on the horse's assessment, the lower assessed horse will draw in front of the higher assessed horse yep. or a horse in relation to how much prize money it's earned in its last five starts, yep. that can be another way we determine to yep. sort of even the fields out even to make, field a, make yeah. a, an even race. Yeah. Yep. Then leave a hold New concept to learn, mate, with the new handicapping system that'll come in. That'll affect you, I guess, with your workload. Yeah, yeah, that that's uh, that'll be a whole new ball game. I, yeah. I think it's definitely got some merit. Yeah, and, you're right. Uh, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, how that all pans out. Yeah. So how long does it take you to get a meeting ready? So nominations uh, are out. Uh, then you've got to do the acceptances. Then we'll do all your work prior to acceptances. How long does it take you to get a meeting organised? Yeah, well, from, from when we collect the nominations um, at acceptance time, then it takes probably a uh, half hour to an hour to go through all the eligibilities because you have to make yep. sure that every horse that's nominated for every meeting is actually eligible for the race they've nominated yep. for. Yep. Uh, and then after the process of if uh, they are in two different races, yep. um, then we have to draw up, obviously draw up the fields, and then at the end of that work out uh, race order, which once again is... Um, restricted a bit by Sky Channel, they yeah. determine, uh, say for the day meetings, they want the larger fields towards the back end of the program, and oh, okay. in the night meetings they prefer the larger fields at the earlier end, which is the better times for wagering, yeah. depending on whether it's a day or a night meeting. Yeah. Is that for the follow on from thoroughbred punters that automatically come over to harness when they kick in and they like the bigger fields? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, then once we've done that, then... Uh, we have to then apply all the uh, the race names and yep. all the exotics and uh, then uh, get the fields ready to go and then have um, send a, we also send an SMS to each owner oh, okay. um, when, just before prior to the fields being released to yep. notify them of what horse is drawn, um, what barrier it is and what time the race is. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, so that whole process probably takes around three to four hours. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And how long have you been in the role, mate? I've seen you around here for years, it feels like. <laughs> I've been in this role uh, since 2014. Right, yes. okay. And you drove in your own right before that. I remember you used to drive regularly with black and white colours. Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I drove for about 10 or 15 years prior yep. to um, coming in this role. But, yep. um, yeah, 
that uh, seems a lifetime ago now. Yeah, <laughs> and how do we go with um, you know the meetings that are short on numbers? Do you have to get on the phones and ring the trainers and try and fill the fields up, or not? Uh, not so much now since uh, we've gone back to the two meetings a week. Yeah. It, it seems it seems a level which is um, we're still not having a lot of overflow of horses missing a start, but yeah. we've got to the stage now where the uh, the fields are filling up and we're having a lot more sort of 9, 10, 11 horse yeah. fields. and it looks so much better. I know it, people yeah. find it harder and it's, you know, some back in the field maybe not get the, the right chance, but bigger fields just look more exciting. It's the product we used to know from years ago, yeah. really, isn't it? Yeah, it's a stronger product and it's better for wagering, which yeah. in turn gives more revenue to the industry and... Uh, Everyone wins that That's way. That's what we're about. That's right, yes. Yep. All right, mate. Well, thanks for your time. I could sit here and talk to you for ages about harness racing, of course, <laughs> but um, carry on. Get the Make sure we get these fields up and about and keep the uh, uh, horse numbers as high as we can, I guess. That's where we need to be, isn't it? That's correct, yep. yep. No worries. All right. Pronto United Finance provides a professional, friendly and personalised service, offering competitive consumer lending solutions for whatever your current lifestyle finance requirements may be. We offer secured and unsecured loans for all types of items and occasions, large or small. It might be for a car or motorbike, a boat, a jet ski or caravan, and even horse floats. It might even be for a holiday or wedding. Contact us today, get your pre-approval in place and your mind at ease. Pronto United Finance, putting your personal needs first. Well, we hope you enjoyed the behind-the-scenes segment there uh, from Harness Racing SA. David Thuan, of course, the racing operations manager. Um, yep. Rocky, very, yep. he was a very talented driver as well. Yeah, uh, I remember he, him driving. He, yeah, he was... I used to have records of certain things years and years ago, and David, uh, at a certain time when he was driving, had the best record of winning from outside the front row in a mobile start. Uh, and back in those days, uh, Barrier 6, but yeah, very yeah. talented. And we had Greg Norman, who said, you know, David was a very good driver, very, and he won with mm. Mythical Beast in the Capunda Cup and drove yeah. him there. And yeah. Aaron Quinton, well, he, he started off as a cadet steward, uh, I think in 2015, okay. uh, now a steward. And uh, look, his family's involved in many different things in thoroughbred racing and, and also duck breeding as well. And I think Aaron is uh, trying to become one of uh, Australia's number one duck judges as well in, ah. on the show circuit. So they race them? Um, I don't think so, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know if they eat them. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, yeah, so uh, there's a little bit of insight of what they do in the offices Excellent. of Harness Racing SA. Now, um, for our guests I've, um, and viewers, I promised you a special guest yep. today. Mm -hmm. And um, he's sitting right next to me. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> so I thought um, it's an opportune time, mate, to... Um, to talk about you, you've been around the place for 25 years, really, and and yes, everyone knows you as the commentator of Globe Derby Park, but also the surname you're born into a pretty famous harness racing family. Yeah, you did drive yourself. Um, what held you back from that career in the end, mate? Um, yeah, you know, look, I, I suppose I really wanted to be a, a commentator. Um, I wanted to be a driver. Yeah. When I was a young lad, I wanted to drive horses and I, I wanted to drive very well and drive with success. Mm. And I used to go out and help my Uncle Bob uh, out at Bolivar. Yep. Uh, and, and I'd live there on weekends. Okay. And, and Bobby had a milk round uh, that him and his wife Lorraine, Marnie Lorraine, they'd do two different segments of the milk round. So yep. all around Globe Derby, Bobby would deliver the milk to all the, all the people that are training and driving at Globe mm. Derby St Kilda area. Branch out as far as uh, Virginia, and my auntie would do that. So when it came to Saturday morning, Wayne, Bob's son, who lived yeah. next door to yeah. Bob and Lorraine, yeah. and myself, we'd do all the fast work for all the horses okay. on a Saturday. So we'd go to Globe Derby backtrack and do fast work together and yeah. stuff like that. So we'd work all the all the horses. Uh, Wayne had his own group of horses, yeah. and, and they were stabled in the same area. And uh, yeah, I got involved in driving. Uh, never ever drove a winner for Bobby. Uh, oh, which, did you? Yeah, no, it was disappointing for me. Yeah. Um, but he gave me a lot of opportunities. And just to give you an idea of how much of a numbskull I was, <laughs> uh, I, he, he actually purchased a horse uh, for me to drive because yeah. I was going out there helping. And it was probably a four hundred dollar horse or something like that. Mm. And basically, he gave me one instruction only: my first race drive, whatever you do don't go down to the fence. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking, well, it's the quickest way home, you know, and this horse is like 50 to one. Mm. And anyway, so what does Nigan Poop do? Yeah. Yeah. 
goes down on the fence. And this was at Capanda. And then I realised why he told me not to go down the fence, because the horse actually didn't like being on the fence. It would lay out and hang right. out, you see. So when I got back after driving... The, a little bit told off? Yeah, well, he, no, he said not much at all, and that meant that he was very mm. unhappy with me. But, yeah, I wanted to drive a winner for him. But, look, I did drive a double at Victor Harbour. Yeah. Um, uh, which was something that I... That'd I, be great. That would have yeah, been on the old track, obviously. Yeah, exactly, yeah. on the old, old track. And, um, and a great track to to be involved in, I reckon, because the crowd was pretty close and it was always a big crowd, so... Yeah, it was good. Nice track to get yeah. a double, mate. Um, but, yeah, drove five, five winners in total. Uh, OK. But, but I, I learned a lot from Uncle Bob. He actually was... Um, he was extremely talented, uh, and he had a knack of... Uh, he had a good association with a trainer called Bill Moyle. Yep. Uh, Bronze Honey was one of their really good horses, yep. and he had a, a really good knack of um, balancing horses and getting the best out of the horse. Yep. He, he, was, he was good with the whip. Back in those days, they had the cane whip, and mm -hmm. then they switched to the swish whip. But he also was very good at keeping the, the bit in the horse's mouth and... and and uh, tricking it to thinking that it's still going okay. Yeah. Whereas okay. nowadays you see the cowboys, they just throw their reins and yeah, as soon yeah. as they do that, the horse just stops, you know? Stops. And, and he helped me win a race, at, at my first ever race at uh, Strathalbyn. Uh, I drove a winner, so I called my first ever race at Strathalbyn mm -hmm. and I drove my first ever winner at Strathalbyn oh, wow. as well. And uh, different year, obviously. Mm -hmm. This was in 85 or something like that. And, and we were driving back from Murray Bridge Trots the previous Sunday and uh, someone came with Uncle Bob and myself to the Trots and, and Bobby, uh, the bloke that was with us, I forget who it was, said to Bobby, oh, that horse you drove out, we hold and just bolted in. And Bobby said, nah, he said it was flat. It was, it was mm. dead. He said, but you were just sitting there like that. He said, there was nothing left. He said, if I let its head go, it would have got beat. Yeah. And he said, to, he said to Albie, he said, get rid of the horse, sell it if you can because it's not much good. Yeah. Anyway, the next week it was in at uh, Strathalbyn and Jock Dunlop was on because Albie used a, a yep. claiming driver yep. to keep it in that lower class because Bobby told him the horse wasn't much good. And I drew where I was going to be behind her and, and Peter Lawrence actually trained the horse that I drove, Dancing Butler, and I said to him, listen, I'm going to sit behind the leader. I said, but I'm going to have to come out the bell because the odds on favour is weak. My uncle told us it's no good. It'll, yeah. it'll just die, you know. Uh, or well, not die literally. So I, I come out, I come out with a lap to go, and and did exactly what happened. And, and the leader, which was odds on, just dropped back through dropped the back. field because Jock started chasing it like that, yeah, and, and it just stopped. There. Yeah, and I, that's where I drove my first winner. Yeah. Well, how many did you drive in the lounge room, mate? Remember plenty, the, plenty. plenty yeah. yeah. I mean, when I was younger, I used to <laughs> I used to sit on my bed and I'd get I'd get the the cord from my dad's dressing gown. I'd tie one <laughs> one around one foot, one around the other. Yeah. That was my reins. Mum had the old upright um, uh, dry, uh, the clothes dryer. Yeah. And uh, basically, they used to have these rails which were plastic coated or wood. <laughs> you could pull them out to hang your clothes on. Right. Now, where it's all tumbled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd grab those. And then I'd be I'd be getting the, the pillow between my legs was a horse and I'd be flogging the <laughs> one of the pillow and calling the race at the same time and Paleface Adios was around that era. So yeah. that's uh, and sort of like I, I really wanted to be a driver but a, a commentator as well at the yeah. same time. So and commentating come about when my cousin Wayne uh, he said, Look, calling the pony races uh, yeah. uh, the bloke that was calling took off. Hmm. And he said, we need a commentator, can you help us out? And I said, all right. So I started calling pony races and did that for... But that wasn't just... You didn't just morph into a Globe Derby commentator in a short space of time. Oh, no, it was a 15-year apprenticeship. We're talking an apprenticeship. apprenticeship. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I find that amazing that it's 15 years, A, your perseverance to keep going for that long, mm. uh, trying to find your vocation that you wanted, but B, how how long it took for them to realise that you probably were pretty good at this because your reputation isn't just harness racing or thoroughbreds or dogs, whichever one you want to call. You've got a really strong reputation in the cycling world, haven't you, without being yeah, boasting. Look, you have got a, yeah. a worldwide reputation. I did, call, I did call the first 17 editions of the Tour Down Under, yeah. uh, which has become our biggest sporting event. I mean, I, I stopped doing that in 2015 because uh, enough was enough of that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, look, it, it was hard to get a job. I, I tried to get a job. In fact, I give up. 
Mm. I give up trying to get a job calling the trials. I called the trials for Botra every Wednesday night for 10 years. And that was the progression of everyone before me, like yeah. uh, Terry McAuliffe before me did that, Bruce McAvaney, Mark Aston, mm. uh, and they got a job virtually, I think, mainly because Fred Jones, who was the president of Botra, yeah. he knew the people to ask, say, look, this guy's OK, uh, put him in a job. Mm. And obviously, McAvaney's very good, and so is McAuliffe and Mark Aston, very yeah. good on the television. And they were the ones that went before me. But yeah. unlucky me... Fred resigned as president of the Botra and then someone else took over, so they, they didn't push, you see. So I had to do my own pushing, mm. and I, I think that it was, was worth the wait, though, wasn't it? Because your first oh, SA yeah. Cup call was safe and sound? It was, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and there was this much in it. Yeah. yeah and I, I was probably a bit stupid going for the photo, but Sorrento Star was on the inside. Uh, Peter Lawrence drove her mm. for uh, Peter Manning, and John Justice yeah. was on the outside with Safe and Sound. And I, I spoke with Alan Pfeiffer, who was the judge at the time. He said, Jimmy, there was there was uh, six pixels in that, which is like a quarter of an inch. Yeah. And I called Safe and Sound as the winner. So some might have said that, that was... That would have got the confidence up a bit, mate, for the well, rest of the... Well, I had a go, and, and yeah. that's what I used to do. But now my eyes are shot. I... I I try and not have a go at photos because I get too many wrong now. <laughs> <laughs> but the last thing I want to ask, mate, like, it's uh, worldwide you call when you lost your voice. Now, yeah. people have said to me a lot of times, poor bloke, he must have been that crook that day. But it was almost like, because you don't mind having a chat, eat a dictionary for breakfast every morning, mm. you, your voice had just said to you that day, enough's enough, mate. Yeah. There was no virus. It was just, I'm out of here. You can have a rest for a couple of days. Well... It, it was a, it was a long lead up into it. Yeah, uh, I, I got the flu, and I got the flu in my own fault. I went to Brisbane like the Thursday before that weekend. Yeah. Got wet. Uh, I was in in the room and I left the air conditioning on and sat there on. My, I'd just been to the boss yeah. at Albion, where the um, Sandgate Road, where our radio tab um, headquarters are in Queensland, and got wet going to where I, I was staying at the casino and yeah. always stay at the Treasury when I go to Brisbane mm -hmm. and instead of changing my clothes and having a shower while I was wet I just sat on the laptop and typed a few things and the air conditioning system went through me and I went to, back to Adelaide on the Friday and I could feel my throat getting a bit sore and uh, I said to my wife Priscilla I said Saturday when I had to call at Globe Derby the next night I said listen make up a honey lemon flask and I yeah. took that with me because I knew my throat was getting worse then I had to do Port Perry trots on Sunday <laughs> uh, and and we were we were full we there was no one spare to call yeah. so I had to go there was no one there that could I couldn't put my hand up for a sickness yeah. I had to go Thursday uh, on the on the on Sunday and I went that, my voice was very rough and just getting worse and worse yeah. and worse. And then when it came to Monday morning, I thought, oh, well, I went to work yesterday when I shouldn't, I'll go to work today. And I got there and I had to do a uh, stand-up interview uh, preview for Sky 2 because David Aldred was trying to push right. uh, harness racing and Sky 2 had just been introduced. Yeah. And we got a spot there that we could promote the day of racing. So when I was doing the stand-up preview, uh, my voice was shocking. <laughs> So anyway, I, I rang. I quickly rang Brendan Yates. It was a half hour before the first race. I said, Yatesy, I said, my voice is gone, mate. I, I, and he said, well, look, I'm out shopping with my daughter, Matisse. He said, the quickest I can get there is in two hours by the time I get Matisse yeah. to the mother or mother-in-law and, and get there. I said, OK. I said, I'll see you I'll go and I'll let you know. Well, as you know, I couldn't get through couldn't the first get through race. It, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, yeah, well, that was the infamous part, I suppose, of, of my career that I lost mm. my voice and people wanted a part of it. Mm. But, uh, and I continue to say this, the media got it wrong because that day they missed the wrong story. And, and I was interviewed by 14 radio stations the next day and I, I tried to tell every single one of them, listen, there's a young lady who got injured really badly yesterday in the last race, the same day. Mm. I called the first race, lost my voice. Danny Hill got injured right. the last race the exact same day. And I said, I want to talk about her. None of them wanted None to talk about that. Mm. And as we know, that is the real story of the day. You're right. Right? She's come out, broken all the South Australian records, yeah. and that is the story of the day, yeah. not some old grey-haired fat bloke that went to work <laughs> when he shouldn't have, you know? Yeah. Well, mate, um, we did uh, surprise you a bit with this. and I, I just thought it was... It was necessary. Everyone knows Jim Jakes. Not everyone knows the bloke Jim Jakes. I certainly have not heard you call for the last 20 years and met you when we started doing this show. And I'd, I'd say to people that uh, got to know you really well and, and uh, funny bloke with a lot of knowledge and terrific to, to have a chat to you. 
Crikey. Thank you very much. Good on you, mate. Very good. And we'll be back after a break. Etchers. With over 30 years combined experience, we endeavour to make your presentation the best it can be. We specialise in all things corporate, from your company's major awards through to your club's trophy needs, as well as sports uniforms and equipment. Our giftware range is second to none, which you can view on eBay. All you do is just type in Etches. Etches is proud to be your one-stop shop, making everything a whole lot easier for you. Etches, proudly supporting harness racing in South Australia. Please come and see us at 142 Port Road, High Marsh. And welcome back to Mobile Rolling. We're here with new Harness Racing SA board member, Scott Barclay. Scott, welcome. Thanks, Lockie. Well, first off, um, for those of for our viewers that ever don't know you, since you're a new board member with Harness Racing SA, tell us a little bit more about your business background and yeah. where you come from. Yeah, definitely. So uh, basically, I've been in senior management roles with large corporates in the building industry yep. uh, for the last 15 years. Um, I think I bring a millennial perspective to things. I'm yep. still in my mid-30s. I've got a young family, um, got a uh, long-standing family history in harness racing with my father-in-law, yep. David Brook. Um, he was a rider. He's a current uh, owner. Yep. And uh, his father, uh, Kevin Brook, was uh, a very famous rider in South Australia, back, a driver back in uh, back in the 70s. So, yep. uh, yeah, in terms of my what, what what I bring to the to the board, I guess is um, uh, I'm a general business representative. Um, I think I complement the board well in terms of bringing a new perspective to how we look at things yes. and, and where we can take the industry. Um, one of the things that I said when I uh, when I went for my interview was that success breeds success. Yeah, exactly. So effectively, if we can get more trainers, if we can get more breeders, if we can get more riders into yeah. the industry, well, success will bring success and uh, bring a lot of confidence back into the industry, which yep. is really important for the, the long-term uh, long jeopardy yeah. of what we're trying to achieve. And as you said, it's important to have that mix on the board because we have the harness racing people on the board and we also have the business people on the board. Um, when it comes to managing a organisation like harness racing, SA, it's very important to have that mix. Yeah. That's right. Well, the, the, the role of the board is to obviously govern. Yeah. Uh, the board isn't operational. It's more of a government point of view. So yep. you can't come on to a board with too many biases. Yep. Uh, you can't be emotional. You have to look at things very practically. Yeah, from a business standpoint. From a, bit, from yeah. a business standpoint. And, that, and that's the way that you can move a business or an, or yep. an industry forward yep. from a strategic positioning point yep. of view. Well, one of the um, main problems that faces the industry at the moment is prize money and, um, of course, uh, we, we don't have a, a massive horse population and that's some of, the thing, some of the things the board is going to have to tackle over the next few of months. Course, yeah. um, what are some of the things, uh, some of the ideas you can bring um, to the board uh, regarding yeah. some of the issues the industry is facing at the moment? Yeah, well, I think, I think this is a classic example of, of, of the yearling sales today, yeah. which, which follows the successful night that we had last night. Yeah. Um, I think it's important that, like I said at the start of the interview about confidence, yep. bringing confidence into the decisions that we make to ensure that people are, are excited about what's happening in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, I've obviously only just started, so yep. my, my uh, understanding of exactly what the initiatives are moving forward are, yep. are limited at this point. But from what I can see, the board's well advanced in mm -hmm. terms of a strategic plan and implementing it. Yep. Um, but these things, of course, take time. Yes. And, uh, and like I said, I think the success of today yep. and last night is, is evident that yep. it's on the right track. Exactly. And uh, as, as I said, some of the main goals with the board would be to get prize money back on track, get the horse population back on track. And, um, and that's some of the main things they have to implement. And as you said, it's not an easy task. It's no. not going to take two, three months. It's going to be a yearly task and it's going to be something we have to approach on a yearly basis. So, Absolutely. Um, as I said, it's a big task. So. Um, yeah, you know, best of luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no. uh, well, Scott Barclay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the board of Harness Racing SA. It's fantastic to uh, have you on. First off, we're at the Yearling Sales today, and we had SA Cup last night. It's a big weekend, one yes. of the first weekends involved with the sport. What do you think of it so far? You know? I think it's fantastic. I think uh, it's exciting for the industry. Last night was, uh, whilst there was a, a bit of drama at, at one point, I think yep. it was a great turnout and yep. I think the overall feel from the people that I talked to, was, yep. they were quite excited about the night and today, I mean the 
auctions going on right now and we, yep. we hope that that's a success and continue yep. to, to build on it year on year out. Yep. Yeah. Well, anyway, Scott Barclay, thank you thank for joining you. us um, and welcome to the Borg of Harness Racing SA and it's uh, great to see you here today at the yearling sale. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Barclay. Thank you. Welcome back, boys. And here we are again with Toby Ryan, uh, resident vet for Vet Talk on Mobile Rolling. How are you today? Good, thanks. Cheers. It's been a while since I've seen you. Yeah. No, that's it. <laughs> so I have a topic I really want to talk about, being this prime time of year, um, mares and putting them in foal and sort of pregnancy maintenance. Mm. What what can you fill me in on? Yeah, well, a lot of people have done the hard work now and, and invested their, their, their hard-earned bucks and got their mares in foal. And I guess the, the pregnancy maintenance is, is, is a critical thing in this next uh, next sort of six to eight month window um, because, uh, you know, there is mares that are, can be repeat offenders, mares that have slipped foals in the past. And, uh, and often, unfortunately, it's a problem where history repeats. And we know a bit more about what goes on with these mares now. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, infections, bacterial infections. Sometimes it's uh, early degeneration of the placenta, placenta loss. So, um, you know, there's things we can do. So on the infection side of things, yep. what do you mean by that? How, how could the placenta or the foal end up with an infection during pregnancy? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's often a bacterial thing. Um, Sometimes it's the immediate result of, of a mare whose back end confirmation might not qu quite be right and as a result have manure and faeces dribble into her reproductive tract. And um, so a simple procedure that we do to, to uh, you know, keep that area cleaner and avoid any of that dribble getting in there is, is what we call a caslix, which is a fancy word for a stitch up. You know, we can, we can stitch up, just leave a little urination gap at the bottom, but we can stitch up a fair amount of the vulva to keep, uh, keep from dribble in there. But it's a, it's a big source of contamination to the repro tract where, yeah. where infections can come about. So, so that's, a, that's something. Um, you know, if you, if you suspect the mare's not in great health and, and uh, you know, blood testing might confirm infection and, and there, are safe, there are safe antibiotics to use during pregnancy. You know, yeah. some people are worried about treating a pregnant mare, but, but there are antibiotics that we know that don't have any negative effects on the fetus. Um, uh, and by the same token, there's also hormone therapy that can help the placenta thrive that don't have any negative effects on the fetus. So there are treatment options if, if, if you're worried about your mare having done this before, there is a chance you'll do it again. They, so they do repeat. it would always be best, if able, of course, to know the mare's history. Correct. So, but if, if you're working with a blank canvas, a maiden mare, yep. or an unknown history, yep. you might have been told she has, you know, fold in the past, but you've not had that hands-on information. What sort of process do we maybe take on in watching? Do we do early intervention? Do we do early scans, blood tests? What should we yeah, maybe do? Well, young, healthy mares, look, you know, there's always a first time something can go wrong, but generally we don't have big issues with those. It's often the older girls that have had a few foals that are a bit flawed in that area. But, but certainly the biggest thing to keep an eye out for is any discharges, you know, yeah. because... If you're getting a little bit of placental breakdown, the first thing you'll get is, is um, discoloured disc discharges from the vulva. And, and uh, it's not necessarily the end of the road if you act quickly. You, you know, so, um, yeah. you can get straight in with, with, with treatment and sometimes get them through those final months of pregnancy to get a viable foal. So um, best thing is early intervention, correct. no matter what. Don't so. think to yourself, oh, that discharge looks a bit funny. I'll... I'll check her again next week. Yeah, you know, no, act on it straight away, straight save her. the mare, save Give the foal. Yep. Yeah, no, mm. that's excellent. And what about like racing? A mare in foal, can yep. she still race? Yeah, Is there that is a okay? Of time and, and, you know, there's uh, the, the late great Colin Hayes used to do it with race mares a lot with those ratty, poor, temperamented fillies. He used to love putting them in foal to win a couple of races because they'd become so much more content and level and, you know, quiet and they'd just, they'd just be a lot lot more uh, hormonally regulated by the pregnancy hormones um, so but there's a window of time it used to be 150 days so you could get quite through pregnancy but nowadays with welfare of things we've, we've got that back to 120 days in the rules but still that that can sometimes be a very effective window of time and known of many mares to win multiple races by the benefits of the pregnancy hormones keeping their own balance just more level yeah. and yeah, happier, you know, it's amazing sometimes, yeah. you know, those sorts of things, how naturally can take place and help support like a mare and in 
many cases, obviously, yeah, help push them and support them to yeah. uh, go that extra step. Lead so. yep. That's wonderful. No All right. Well, thank you so much. I love catching up with you each week. No worries. And uh, back to you, boys. Just wrecking Toyota. South Terrace Wingfield for all your recycled and reconditioned parts. Our huge range covers almost every model in the vast Toyota stable. Proudly South Australian with over 25 years in the automotive recycling industry. So, if you want to save some serious money on anything Toyota, call us on 8359 for fast and friendly service. Yeah, welcome back everyone to Mobile Rolling. Once again, special thanks to our vet, Toby Ryan and Liz Barbaro for uh, great interview work there and hopefully that gives you a bit of insight uh, about what they were talking about there and I'm sure it'll help you down the line. Um, Rocky, uh, we started the show with David Tewan and Aaron yep. Quinton. Um, these, these people that are working at Harness Racing SA, they have the responsibility of running the... The harness racing for the participants. Yep. I think it's fair right. to say. And I think sure. there's over 2,000 participants when you look at owners, trainers, drivers, and stable hands mm -hmm. in, in South Australia. So that's their job. They've got that responsibility to run it at, a, at an efficient cost and make sure everything's right. And I've got to say, I, I know David too, and um, I speak to him on a regular basis. Yep. And I know he's got his position at heart. I know that he wants everything to work. And, and I think it the end of his career, he'd like a pat on the back and say, yeah, you did a good job, did a good David. Job. Yeah, so, and, yep. uh, and I'm, I'm sure with the support of the people that are there, uh, that he'll definitely give it his best shot uh, mm. in his role in particular. Yeah. No, it's good. It's always good to find out what these people do. Everyone sort of sees them around and maybe has a bit of a whinge about what goes on in HRSA. Well, They've all got jobs to do, mate. They're doing as best they can. Well, they're definitely not sitting on their hands doing no. nothing. We saw no, that that's when, right. when you were there with the cameraman. Yep. You know? Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah. Now, busy weekend, really, Friday night. Yeah, Mount, down Gambia, the, down the Mount Gambia Friday night, uh, Globe Derby Saturday night. Yep. We'll see the rerunning of the SA Botra Derby yep. on, on Saturday night. And, of course, Sunday at Port Pirie, we've got the uh, Kadena Cup at Port yeah. Pirie. So, yeah, big weekend of racing. It is. A lot of driving for a few of the drivers and, mm. and trainers as well. Um, any tips this week, mate? Well, you're we... the tipster. You're the tipster, mate. I'm, you know, you're just trying to bring up that I, the ones I tip that can't win. No, win. no, no, that's that's not really true. Okay. But I'd like to take some liberty well, with well, what we're doing in this uh, establishment, mate, because the horses that we've chosen, not the losers, the horses that we've chosen from our guests that we've had in, yes. Paul Cavallaro, yep. next meeting, Culture King wins at a buck seventy. Yep. In comes Scotty, Scotty Ewan, the next meeting, Bulletproof Boy wins at $12. Yep. Dean Girardi in last week, Lock and Bar. Wins, yeah, going to win going to sure. win. Yeah. Craig Norman, I'm pretty sure he just tipped Cowgirls and Lace that night that it would win at period 50 to 1, so we're claiming that one. Okay. Yep. Kenny Rogers was here last week lurking around the background. He drove a double on Monday, and you probably don't know, but he did tell me that out there, that they'd both win. Yeah. So, I'll, so I'll grab those. Break the track record with the, and, the um, as well. And yeah. your co-host has tipped uh, three from three. Yes. So one dollar outlay, mate, on those horses. What mm. do you reckon we're up to so far? Oh, geez, I wouldn't know. Uh, oh, a bit of value there with cowgirls and lace, mm. wouldn't there? I don't know, 10,000? 600,000 plus. 600,000. For a dollar all up investment so far Just on the, the guests right that we come in. So, of course, our guest this week is Jim Jakes. <laughs> well, so, there's, a, there's a loss. So we've got just over 600,000 going on to your selection, mate. So we'll close with that, I reckon. My selection? Yeah. Have not got one. Have not done the form. Okay. Well, you should have pre-warned well, me. Well, I'll cover you again and I'll say uh, Wayne Hill will win on Big Behemoth okay. at uh, Piri on Saturday Port night. Piri. Yeah. Okay, Big Behemoth. So we're going into that. Okay. It might tick us over about a meal. Yeah. Sounds good. For a dollar. You've done well. You've pointed people in the <laughs> right direction. And what's on next week, mate? Well, next week we're going to have a, another session of uh, Harness Racing SA with yep. uh, some people that are in the offices of Harness Racing SA. Um, I think what we might do also is look at the evolution or the history of Harness Racing. I mean, they're yep. looking after Harness Racing, and it's my belief, I'll do some more research for next week, but it's my belief this will be the 100th year uh, that we saw the first ever trotting race in South oh, okay. Australia. So yep. uh, uh, I'll do more research on that, but we'll come with, yeah, look, it'll be a, a little turn back in history, turn the clock back and, and find out where this sport's going to or where it's come from, more okay. to the point. Yeah. Fantastic. 
All right. All right, mate. All right, so make sure you're with us next week on Mobile Rolling. And uh, look, on behalf of Rocky Butterworth, Jimmy Jake saying thank you very much for watching.